Hi, good afternoon. Um, I would like to give a brief presentation together with my colleague, um, um, Masahi Kuta from uh, uh, connecting from Tokyo NEC Corporation. Uh, we would like to discuss uh, high performance computing value addition in exploration and production of oil and gas. Uh, the first slide that I'll show you uh, basically it shows different uh, stages of EMP that uh, uses uh, HPC and of course AI uh, for various uh, purposes. As an example, starting with exploration, we collect large amounts of data and uh, uh, we take this data to basically look for specific trends in the data that might give us some hints about where are the potential hydrocarbons. So we do that through uh, data mining, imaging, and a lot of other operations that I'll discuss in a minute. Once we have the uh, uh, exploration is done and we have drilled our wells and developed the field, we eventually have a reservoir that we need to manage. And of course, that will require uh, various uh, activities that uh, uh, the objective is to improve performance of the uh, reservoir as well as uh, basically improving production. So that uh, involves uh, reservoir monitoring and surveillance. Also, uh, a lot of real time activities that uh, requires uh, fast uh, computing power and analysis of a lot of data uh, at the same time. Uh, we also build uh, so-called proxy models to create a fast system emulators that uh, mimics the subsurface. And then we can do various sensitivity analysis uh, to see if uh, that certain parameters that uh, uh, we might use in our operation might uh, impact uh, different uh, aspects of reservoir performance. So that uh, proxy model or digital twins that we create also requires a large amount of computing and data uh, manipulation. We also do so-called performance computing, again, uh, when we are doing real-time prediction of system response, both during a drilling process as well as uh, fluid injection. Uh, we uh, analyze the performance of the system and uh, make uh, decisions on how we should move forward. And finally, when the fields get old and some of the uh, uh, say pumps or other instruments start uh, decaying, we might want to be able to do so-called um, predictive maintenance or um, a failure prediction so that we can solve the problem before it becomes a bigger problem. So these are basically different uh, steps of um, EMP that requires high performance computing. Uh, in the next slide, uh, I would like to emphasize that uh, uh, given the fact that we have large amounts of data that we have to deal with, we, we also need to address the so-called 4D, 4D concepts in oil and gas operation. So it is not just the amount of the data that uh, we have to deal with, with the large volume, but also the fact that the data comes to us uh, with some speed and the uh, streaming data in uh, real time, as well as the variety of the data that we have to deal with in green and veracity or uncertainty level of different data components. So all of these things uh, impact various steps of our exploration and drilling and production. And of course, I have color coded different uh, components of these uh, operations where different aspects of 4D plays a key role. Uh, for example, 3D seismic collection, uh, of course, involves large volumes of data. And if you wanna do some quality control of the 
data collection process. We might also do some real-time visualization of the data so that we can make some uh, tweaks onto to the pro acquisition process. And the same is true with the drilling process. Uh, we might uh, want to do some so-called geo-steering, which involves various data from uh, different sources that we need to combine to, to steer the drilling. And of course, production optimization requires so-called 4D seismic data that um, gives us an idea how the fluid or is moving and uh, whether we need some sort of uh, enhanced oil recovery uh, to uh, get better uh, values for um, like, uh, basically reservoirs um, recovery factor. Next. So in general, um, the whole EMP value chain involves various aspects of um, uh, data uh, measurement and uh, modeling and subsurface imaging and interpretation and characterization and simulation, reservoir simulation and eventually infill drilling and production optimization and EOR. So this whole value chain basically shows that, uh, that uh, we have to deal with various issues, the applications that we need to work with, with and challenges that we have to deal with. I will, so I will only emphasize this HPC value addition and for each step, and basically the measurement uh, we might have to do some real-time um, analysis of the data that we are, we are collecting. So that uh, uh, real-time uh, interaction with the data acquisition process is uh, requires a high performance computing. And of, of course, when we are doing subsurface imaging through the modeling process, as well as um, different types of so-called migration uh, including say reverse time migration. Uh, th these operations uh, we can move from matter of few days uh, to matter of few hours. Um, and of course, this interaction between the modeling and imaging uh, can be made seamless if we can do the operation much faster. Uh, the interpretation process might also require uh, AI and machine learning. And again, uh, high performance computing can help us uh, uh, different types of data mining and other techniques to do so-called uh, man-machine interface so that the human intelligence about the interpretation of the uh, response of the subsurface and um, the um, basically machine analysis of uh, different um, types of uh, alter, alternative interpretation can give us a little bit of a, a, head, a head up on um, how we are moving forward. And the same is true with uh, being able to do a lot of reservoir simulation uh, in real time. And uh, um, of course, uh, next, if we have a more efficient way of doing these things, we can create a large number of um, um, reservoir models that we can choose the right one from that ensemble of um, stochastic reservoir simulation models and uh, help us with better understanding of how things are moving forward and do better history matching. And finally, of course, uh, if we are doing reservoir surveillance during the production, we would like to have uh, real-time feedback uh, from um, the operation and perhaps uh, give some uh, uh, input to some of the uh, operational parameter decision-making process that we may have. Uh, so I think um, basically um, I'm, what I want to emphasize is each step of this whole operation involves a lot of uh, data and it involves a lot of um, high performance computing. Next, the workflow for data analysis, of course, is um, one example of it is shown here. And the emphasis here is that in top left, from the point that we decide to acquire data, 
to the top, bottom right, where we decide to or make decisions to better manage uh, assets that we are dealing with. We go through a large number of processes from acquisition to transmission and data retrieval and basically data fusion, as well as uh, various types of visualization. The bottom line is all of these processes um, really require um, high performance computing. And, uh, and we really uh, need to make uh, good use of uh, our resources in the process. The question I'm posing here uh, is, are we getting computer power and memory capacity gains that we have been used to over the last 10, 20 years? Are we getting into some sort of a plateau or saturation level? and whether uh, we need to uh, uh, come up with some uh, new ideas, how uh, we can uh, continue our quest for securing uh, uh, our energy resources. So uh, my colleague um, Ikuta will um, uh, give you some uh, more details about this, uh, answering this question. So Ikuta, you can take it over. Oh, yeah, Fred, thank you. So, yeah, let me take over. So, yes, as yeah, yes, Fred said, I think we need more and more compute power. But as also Fred said, I often hear that, you know, performance have reached a plateau. Performance have reached a plateau. So it's been a while since people started to say, Moore's law is coming to an end. And is this true? Well, if you look at this chart, you can see the number of transistors, the orange dots, continue to grow. But if you see the blue dots, um, we can understand that thread performance have reached a plateau. And we can see the number of logical cores, the black dots, it is increasing. So the fact here is that we are having more and more cores, but each core performance is not increasing. So this reminds me what late Seymour Cray asked. The father of supercomputing asked, if you were plowing a field, which would you rather use? Two strong oxen or 1,024 chickens? So fundamentally, he asked, do you want more and more cores? Can you handle it? Or in other words, can you use so many cores efficiently and gain performance? Th that was his question. Well, I believe your answer depends on what kind of application you run. And Seema Cray believed two oxen is more efficient in many cases. And that's why he started designing and developed vector computers. So what is vector? What is vector? processes. So some of you might already know what it is, but let me try to explain using this very rough sketch of a uh, general processor or scalar processor, GP, GPU, and vector processor. So a scalar processor core computes relatively small piece of data at one time. And nowadays, scalar processors have many cores in one processor. And GPGPU have massive number of cores or many sets of cores. They have a stronger set of cores and many of those. So they can compute more uh, at one time and output more results at one time. Let, let's forget about you know, the price of GPGPU and scalar processors. On the other hand, vector processors can compute many elements, which is called vector or array. Uh, by a single instruction. So vector processors have very powerful cores. And to load such large data to the processor core or to feed data to the processor core, vector machines have very large memory bandwidth. So th this is vector. But you might say scalar processors have features called SIMD, single instruction, multiple data. So the question is, what is the difference between SIMD and a vector? So I would say the data size is different. 
For example, in AVX512, which is a vector feature for x86 processor, you can handle 512 bit at one time. But in NEC vector computer, which I think is the only real vector machine available today, it can process 16K bits at one operation. So let's call it a AVX 16K. Now let's see how good vector processors can do. First example is a 3D RTM, reverse time migration performance. I'm not sure if you are aware of Madagascar, but it is an open source software package from, for multiple multi-dimensional data analysis. It is not only about oil and gas, but it comes with many modules and sample programs related to oil and gas. So with the help of Madagascar, we compared RTM 3D modeling performance with AMD EPIC processor. So you can see that NEC VE20B, this is the vector processor. It is five times faster than AMD. And if you do minor tunings, you gain another 40% performance increase. And this slide is performance related to reader bias simulation. We tested HyPre. HyPre is a library for scalable solution of linear systems. And as far as I understand, this is the kernel part of reader bias simulations. And HyPre has many solvers, but here we pick up GMRS solver. We tested with these data sets, I believe, related to reservoir simulations. And we can download these from uh, the internet. So again, comparing to MD EPIC processors, VE, vector engine, or vector processors, show good performance. Let's also talk about machine learning and data frame as well. We used an open source library called Rabidis, which supports machine learning library and data frame library. The left chart shows three examples from machine learning, which are logistic regression, k-means, and SVD, singular value decomposition. The right chart is about its TPCH benchmark results showing data frame performance. So again, you can see that vector, the red bars are doing a very good job here. Okay, let me summarize this talk. So Fred told us HPE, HPC is widely used in oil and gas, and there is a strong, strong demand for further performance. But the problem is core performance seems to have reached a plateau. So the question is, what do we do? How can we solve this? And my answer is, well, vector architecture can be an answer here. We saw that in many cases, vector processes are showing very good performance. And finally, I would like to add that this is a tribute to Ken Kennedy, who devoted for automatic vectorization and HPC, HPF, high performance Fortran. So, well, I'm happy to say vector is back. And, and for your information, there is a HPF compiler that runs on a vector machine. So, Yes, that's it. Thank you for your attention.